Okay, so my presentation uh, will be divided into two parts. I will start with a brief overview on German early childhood uh, education and uh, the developments in the, in the last years. And subsequently, I will go into detail about pedagogical documentation. So these are the two main parts. Um, early childhood education in Germany and its development in the last 20 years can be summed up in one word, word which is expansion. Expansion in both a qualitative and a quantitative way. Um, looking at the quantitative dimension, um, an important indicator for the relevancy of early childhood education is the early childhood attendance Cent, uh, childhood center attendance level. And looking at the under threes, uh, it has more than doubled between 2007 and 2016. So that today 33% of the children under three are attending an early childhood center in Germany. Even among the three to six year olds, it has risen uh, in the same time from 89% to 94%. And two key milestones um, in this development were the introduction of legal entitlements to an early childhood center place in 1969 for three-year-olds and recently in 2013 for one-year-olds. So um, every family can send their kids to an early childhood center, but uh, this doesn't mean it is automatically free, which I will talk of, uh, about later on. And this expansion not only concerns the sheer number of children attending early childhood centers, but also the length of the, um, the, of the time they spend there each day. As the diagram shows, the number of children spending less than five hours a day, here in pink, uh, decreased from 2006 to 2015, while the number of children staying seven hours or longer in dark gray increased in the same time. As a result of this increasing number of children attending all daycare, and particularly the greater inclusion of under threes, expenditure on early childhood education has risen significantly in the, years as, in the last years as this diagram shows. This growth corresponds to a rise in the percentage of municipal and federal public expenditure on early childhood education from 3.7% in 2005 to 5.1% in 2011. So this is uh, also a, a great um, expansion in this way. What has remained unchanged, however, is the manner in which early childhood education is financed. Costs are shared between the municipality, the federal uh, uh, state, and the parents with the municipality here in dark gray is uh, with the largest share. The parental contribution, which might be interesting to you, nonetheless varies significantly. In a small number of municipalities, early childhood center attendance is free, while in others, it can be up to 25% of the total cost. <laughs> Furthermore, the parental contribution is means tested, so it can range from zero euro to 500 euro per month. The diagram shows the average contribution in all German states and cities. In almost all federal states, the final year of early childhood center attendance prior to school enrollment is uh, now free for all children. So this part of early childhood education is free for all, all the children and nearly every ch child, I think it's about 97% uh, uh, are attending early childhood centers at the age of five. So school begins at the age of six in Germany. Turning now to the qualitative dimension of expansion, the following two developments are particularly important to note. First, the development of educational plans, and second, the qualification of staff. Firstly, educational plans have been drawn up in all of Germany's federal states in the last 15 years. In Germany, Education does not fall within the remit of the federal government, but is rather in the responsibility of the individual federal states, which are shown here in the map. These are 16 federal states which um, are part of Germany. 
Um, there is therefore no overarching educational plan or curriculum as you have it here, and each of the 16 federal states has developed its own plan. These educational plans are not to be understood as detailed curricula for early childhood education, but rather as rough guidelines for the content and the methods that are to be applied. They are particularly important for the development of early childhood education since it is through these plans that early childhood education comes to be constituted as a first stage in the, in the broader education system and not as a part of social welfare, which it has been for the last years in Germany and which is a st very strong German tradition. And uh, this is maybe the most important change in early childhood education over the last years that it has shifted to become a part of the educational system. But this shift is not uh, completed yet and um, I don't know if it will ever be. The other qualitative dimension of expansion is the, the question of um, qualification of staff. Um, there have been many efforts made in the last 15 years to raise the qualification uh, levels of early childhood teachers. Previously, in the tradition I've been talking about, early childhood center teachers consisted almost exclusively of non-academically qualified individuals and were mainly comprised of what in Germany is known as Erzieherinnen, which means educators. Nevertheless, a num at a number of German universities, at, as, as, at, as, as at the one I am teaching in, um, new courses have been established to train additionally, addition academically qualified teachers um, for early childhood. This diagram here shows um, the growth of first year students and graduates of these study programs starting in 2004 where these um, courses began and um, ending here in 2015. And you can see when you look at the number, 3,500, 3, which is not much for a country with um, 80 billion inhabitants, um, that this uh, development is very slow. Um, and uh, I have also to say that uh, this development has stalled recently since it emerged that in the various early childhood centers, no or only very, very few better paid positions had been established for such academically qualified teachers. And that's why the composition of early childhood center teaching staff uh, currently looks as follows. Only 7% of them are academic uh, qualified, academically qualified. So I'm turning now to uh, my part about pedagogical documentation. And if you have a further question on the system in Germany, you can uh, ask them uh, your questions uh, at the end if you want to. Um, but I think um, it, it, it's uh, clearly related to this qualitative uh, development because the system, systematic documentation of educational processes um, is an essential element of high quality early education. In the last few years, I have engaged intensively with such documentation, and today I'd like to give you an insight into my research. This research is primarily concerned with the German context, but I'd be very interested to find out whether my findings resonate with your experience and whether you might even imagine studies in New Zealand coming, coming to similar conclusions. So documentation incorporates many different methods. First, I can refer to standardized forms such as assessment scales or say di diagnostic methods in uh, linguistic develop language development. These are used to measure and maintain a certain level of development. Second, documentation also um, includes, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Second, documentation also incorporates qualitative process-oriented methods, such as portfolios, documentation panels, and of course, learning stories. Such qualitative methods are the focus of my research and of my talk today as well. In Germany, when we speak of pedagogical documentation, we tend to make four supposedly self-evident assumptions about it. And as I have understood it, the situation seems to be similar in New Zealand. The first is 
um, pedagogical documentation allows for holi a holistic perspective on children. Second, it increases uh, our awareness of situations that are important to children. It thereby gives them a voice and can help to promote child participation. Third, pedagogical documentation focuses on and thus emphasizes the children's strengths. And fourth, pedagogical documentation makes children's learning visible. This set of assumptions about pedagogical documentation can be observed in a wide range of publications. In my talk, however, I would like to call this supposedly self-evident association of pedagogical documentation into question. In the course of my research, I have increasingly gained the impression that the above characteristics of pedagogical uh, documentation are often myths. The first of these myths is then, documentation is holistic. We tend to regard pedagogical documentation as first and foremost a child-oriented method. Unlike standardized forms of documentation, it appears more open. It proceeds in a qualitative and individual manner, focusing on the whole child rather than just their specific characteristics or achievements. If we now turn to learning stories from Germany, from German early childhood centers, we often come across stories such as the following, which Sonja Arndt is so kind to read to you loud in, in English, because you won't understand this. <laughs> So, learning story one is, says, Dear Isabella, you, know, you now know your daily routine very well. When your mum drops you off at the creche, you start your day with a delicious breakfast. Then we fetch the baskets with the rugs. You straight away pulled out a rug and put it on the floor. You took down the cream jar with the screw top lid from the blue shelf. You like that one a lot. Dear Isabella, you took the cream jar and brought it into the middle of the morning circle. When we started our hello, hello song, you sat down next to Daniel. I'm really pleased that you sat still so well in the morning circle. So this learning story describes how Isabella has learned to sit still in the morning circle. I don't know if morning circle is your word. Maybe you say assembly or something. Metal. What do you say? Metal. Oh, OK, OK, yes. OK, makes sense to you. That's the most important. It's the direct <laughs> translation of, um, of our German word for it, which is Morgenkreis. Um, now, this learning story describes how Isabella has learned to sit still in this morning circle. And now you might hear object that although it is presented as a learning story in the headline, it doesn't really amount to one at all. And I would completely agree. The story relates to an isola isolated achievement sitting still in a very particular situation, the morning circle, which has very little to do with the holistic picture of the child's development, but very much to do with the requirements of group supervision, in which emotional control and rule learning are essential. All in all, the concept of a learning story has been fundamentally misunderstood here. And what I refer uh, further down to as learning dispositions, you can guess that this means learning dispositions. Um, and I will translate what is written down there. Um, uh, recognizing rules and internalizing the daily routine are in fact anything but learning dispositions. And aside from its narrative character, this document does not conform to the, the idea of learning uh, stories at all, which I don't have to tell you. But um, this is quite a typical story because the majority of learning stories I studied in Germany, which, are, uh, which were over 300 learning stories, also failed in one respect or another to conform the concept of a learning story, or even contradicted it. In my research, I compared the principles of learning stories developed here in New Zealand with the practical usage of such stories. My criteria in this comparison included a focus on learning dispositions, on the child's strength, on everyday situations, and on accessibility for children. The results of the evaluation were as follows. So you can see that nearly 60% nearly contradicted the concept, and um, only 22% uh, were conform with the concept. So the holistic view isn't really realized in German. 
uh, learning stories. Looking at the second point, documentation fosters child participation. One important argument in favor of pedagogical documentation is that it is supposed to enable child participation. But what exactly does participation mean here? One important aspect of participation involves taking children seriously as addressees, and often, however, documentation remains inaccessible to children, as in this example of a documentation panel displayed too high for the children to see it. So you can see here is the ground, and there is the panel, and even my head would be over there. <laughs> so even the parents uh, won't uh, have it easy to access this one. In other cases, handwritten commentary can even exclude children who are already able to lead a few, read a few letters or words, as in many documentation panels or in this portfolio example. The portfolio is, is one of the most widely used documentation methods in Germany. The, ex the example here is especially representative since the majority of portfolio entries consists of photos commented on by teachers, just as you can see it here. If one takes participation to mean the inclusion of children in the process of producing documentation, then their participation here is as good as absent. This portfolio entry is a collection of pictures without any context, recall the point about holism before, which the teacher found pretty and described as more or less creative. In relation to my sample, this means in purely quantitative terms, more than 60% of the portfolio entries were, were made by the teacher. And um, it's, it's worth noting here that the category work um, produced by the child which make, uh, makes up almost 40% of the total. It consists primarily, primarily of worksheets completed by the children or of standardized painting or making exercises, as in the following example. So this is what uh, many um, educators, Erzieherinnen, learn at, at, at their school, which lasts about four years. And this is very typical. And every child has this picture in its portfolio. So, if child participation thus means taking children seriously as addressees, involving them in the process of documentation and documenta documenting things that are important to the children themselves, then in many documentation processes, such participation uh, does not take place. I'm coming to myth three focusing on strength. For Margaret Carr, a crucial aim of learning stories is the shift, to shift the focus from deficit to credit. My analysis of learning stories shows how widely this idea has now been taken up. Almost all of the learning stories I've read des uh, describe something that the child could particularly do well, a particular ability or positive character trait or something that he or she had just learned. Such learning stories with their warm-hearted and appreciative tone are, very, are a joy to read. Yet the more such learning stories I read, the more uneasy I became. Perhaps you might share this unease in listening to the following learning story, read out again by Sonia. Yeah. Sorry. Dear M. When you first came to the centre, you found it hard to sit still at breakfast time. A grown-up always had to sit next to you. Now you get a plate from the cupboard by yourself and you sit down at the breakfast table. After breakfast, every child washes up his or her plate so that whoever uses it next will have a clean plate. You didn't like this rule at all. You tensed up and moaned when you had to wash up your plate. For many months, the grown-up always did this chore with you. Today, I saw how you pushed our a member of the teaching staff to one side as you wanted to wash up your plate by yourself, which you then did. It's always a joy to see you making such progress. So there's a lot to, um, to be concerned about this story, but I like to focus on one point. This story describes how after resisting for many months, a girl had at once accepted a particular rule and so took a step toward independence and willingness to compromise. So what's wrong with this story? 
Well, there are six sentences devoted to the child's previous behavior, which is seen as problematic, and only two sentences describing her new, positively regarded behavior. It almost seems as though the child's progress is narrated here primarily in order to return in detail to her previous negative behavior. In such, in such a case, we can then hardly talk of focusing on strength. Certain formulations that I found in the great majority of learning stories included, keep up the good work. Well done. It's a pleasure to see how you're coming on. These two are forms of praise, but an unspecific and general kind of praise. In the education studies literature, much has been written about the damage that such praise can do. Here I only want to note that praising is not equivalent to focusing on strength. To focus on strength is to bring out an, and describe an existing ability. To praise, on the other hand, is to evaluate someone's behavior and achievements. Such evaluation always implies a hierarchy. A superior person has the power to assess the value of the subordinate person's behavior. Praise always Im involves a power imbalance. I would now like to invite you to go one step further with me and to radicalize this critique still more. At issue in this learning story, as in many others, is largely a certain norm of behavior and often of achievement to which children are expected to conform. A certain way of holding a pen, for example, a certain level of mobility, a certain degree of subordination, and so on. To me, it seems as though there's a, a very definite hidden agenda for early childhood at work here. A particular norm to which every child ought to conform even if it is not explicitly named as such. But wasn't it precisely pedagogical documentation that was supposed to preserve children from their, subject, their subjection to such norms? We should then ask ourselves how these norms have come to play a role in pedagogical documentation at itself. I'm coming to the fourth and last myth I want to reveal. It, it is called documentation focuses on learning. Today, I can still remember very well when my, my own children played for hours at time with Lego, toy cars, or plastic animals when they were young. I have to confess, though, that I always avoided playing these games with them since I found them terribly boring. The older I get, however, the more I understand that such seemingly simple forms of play are, in fact, a core element of childhood learning processes. It's only now that I have come to realize just how much basic physical, linguistic, mathematical, and social knowledge is contained in such play. Documentation is a crucial tool for bringing such hidden learning processes to light. By means of pedagogical documentation, children's learning is supposed to become visible. Yet here, too, the results of my research are sobering. The majority of the portfolio entries study, I studied are concerned with significant events, experiences, and action in the day-to-day -day life of, of the early childhood center, such as farm excursions, trips to see Father Christmas, the building of a bee hotel, or the application of a particular kinds of painting techniques. These are, of course, all important events in an early childhood center, but are there significant events for the children themselves? Moments at which they are, have a genuine learning experience, perhaps. But it's much more likely that they are events the relevant teachers found to be important. Or, as it is shown in this example, just supposedly more or less beautiful pictures with a nearly meaningless story, which reads like this. It's, it's, um, it's, it's really called learning story in the center I've uh, found it. Uh, it reads like this, it, it, it is so nice watching you play, I wish you an exciting time in the kindergarten. <laughs> to sum up the findings um, of my empirical analysis in one sentence, some of the key aims of pedagogical documentation, such as taking a holistic perspective, enabling child participation, and focusing on strength and learning processes, fail to be realized in many documentation processes. 
This is a so sobering and perhaps even a disappointing insight. I nonetheless want to use the remaining time to say why I believe that pedagogical documentation is still an important and useful tool. I shall elaborate this claim by the way of three others. The first is, we can still find outstanding examples of pedagogical documentation. In the course of my research, I have seen many impressive examples of pedagogical documentation, such as this documentation panel in a German nursery or toddler center. It is located beside, besides a window, which you can see here. Um, it's a corner. Here is another window, and there, uh, and from, from and from this window, they the children can observe the street, and once a week, the dustman coming. Um, the photos, um, which are placed here and here are um, zoomed in. Um, the photos show the dustman and several games the children have played inspired by their observations, e.g. the dust cart on the overhead projector, not the real dust cart, play dust cart. This successful documentation thus values the children's activities without evaluating them and can stimulate reflection on experiences and learning. Examples like these do not account for the majority of documentations I studied, but they do exist. My second point is that pedagogical documentation does need to be, doesn't need to be perfect. Another example, this time from Burlington in the USA, brings me to the next point. Here children were observed using microscopes. They were photographed using the, working with the microscopes. Their comments were written down here and uh, they drew what they saw afterwards, with, which you can see here. Um, this was then a very clear documentation of a classical learning situation, a moment when the children became visible as active learners and research actors. And in so far as the children themselves were responsible for articulating their observations in the form of their commentary, commentary and their pictures, they were the authors of the documentation. But how holistic was it? Was it not lacking some context? Likewise for the following picture. The caption reads, I got a miniature hamster. He's called Bobby and he is gray all over. We can assume that the new pet is important to the child and his commentary later typed up expresses evaluation and emphasizes his strength. But is learning also made visible here? The following example from Reggio in Italy shows a group of children who were observed looking at a documentation panel displaying photos of them. So it's a documentation of a documentation. Here too, the children's comments were taken down. Julia, for example, says, we are these children, while Sergio says, the ones who are three years old. Thanks to these photos, the documentation even allows these young children who are not yet able to read to see what it is about. But is this situation also important to the children? Is it a significant moment or a topic that matters to them? These are all examples of outstanding early childhood center documentation processes. But none of them manages to realize all of the desired goals of pedagogical documentation. And this is inevitable since there is no one-size-fits-all documentation process. Instead, it's important for there to be a plurality of documentation approaches in order to realize the diverse goals of documentation. To this end, certain preconditions are nevertheless required. So high quality requires investment. Let's now take a look at one final example. This documentation um, is concerned with measuring and weighing. On the left-hand side, we see how the children uh, have written their names in, with folding rulers. While on the right-hand side, you see a homemade scale made of two buckets and a clothes hanger. Behind it, there are photos of the children trying out the scales. Now, this documentation only has become possible because the teachers knew 
that measuring and weighing are important basic subjects ones with even nursery school children can engage. The necessary material was already available or could easily, easily be acquired. Space was available for this installation. The teachers had the means to take and print the photos. But especially became possible because the teachers had the idea of making these activities the object of a documentation process and they had the time to produce this documentation. In abstract terms, what is needed to create a high quality documentation is then time, qualifications, creativity, and means. If we could provide these resources, it should be possible to produce pedagogical documentation of high quality and therefore form a counterweight to standardizing and normalizing forms of assessment in early childhood center education. Considering recent efforts to increase the influence of standardized assessment, it is strongly necessary fostering the quality of qualitative documentation. Thank you. So if you have any question, um, I try to answer. Um, I was just wondering what were the theories that were taught in your qualifications or what were educators exposed to in terms of what's the rationale, you know, is there influence, you put up the Regio slide, do, um, is there any professional learning opportunities that could just go to Regio, or what, what are the influences um, that would build a rationale for how they would analyse the learning? How they, uh, the, in the examples, um, I, I, I don't know if I can explain it uh, very well, but um, um, in Germany there is, um, there's a very, um, there's no, um, no concrete curriculum for the teachers to learn. So um, um, we have a, surely a plan of what to do, but it's in the hands of, of their teachers to decide if they uh, look at rego or learning stories or, of, or on assessment scales, um, which are quantitative in a quantitative method. So um, you, can't, you can't be sure that they uh, uh, have contact with learning stories or the theory behind them uh, when they walk through their education. Is this an answer to your question? I mean, that, there's a huge worry. I, I can't yes, quite see yes, how yes. things have advanced. Is it because things have advanced so quickly, or the change has come so quickly? That, so why, it's like this big hole. Oh. Where's the theory? <laughs> yes, yes, um, it's a question I have, I have too. Why, why is it so, the variety uh, um, as such is a good thing, uh, but, um, um, it uh, doesn't, um, it's not clear that uh, they, they learn anything. So um, maybe it's a lack of, uh, of clearness in, in, the, in the educational plans. So are people trying to change that? Is there some strong advocacy to fix? Some. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blown away by that. I find that extraordinary. I think there's a, a, a kind of uh, being proud of this variety in Germany and not um, being aware of the deficit, the deficits that are coming with this um, plurality. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. Um, so did I understand correctly, there is no a curriculum document um, like a state, like Te Whareke here in New Zealand. Sorry, so um, here in New Zealand we have Te Whareke, so there is no document like that no. in Germany no. to assess no. it. Oh, okay. It's it's just the educational plans of the of the of the federal states, and they are very different. Some are very detailed, and some are very um, inspired. <laughs> And um, so, um, if you if you go um, if you have learned uh, as a teacher in Munich and then go to Hamburg, uh, it will be totally different. 
So what do they teach the teachers? <laughs> we don't talk of teaching in these terms. We, um, and this uh, has to do with the tradition in social welfare. So we don't uh, call them teachers. And uh, this is really a difference, because um, um, many um, Erzieherinnen just look after the children and make these um, beautiful um, collages and something with them. And uh, the idea of education is not so widely spread. And uh, or it is spread and uh, told, but it, it is often not understood. Thank you. So Helen, so the, the training of the yes. SEN is quite practical, right? Yes. In, in answer to the question about the theory, <laughs> that it's very much focused, as far as I can understand, on the creations, the ideas about the practical activities that one might do with these children of particular ages and quite focused on those. Yes, but they, they will learn about Ericsson or something like that, but it's not related to the daily practice. It's, it's very um, isolated knowledge and theories that, and developmental. Uh, that are learned. Excuse me? Developmental. Yes. In yes. Orientation. Yeah. Who? <laughs> There's an answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> ah, Amy Pickler. Pickler. Yes, Pickler. yes. Okay, yes. Um, Particularly with this influx of um, under three-year-olds. Yes, yes. That's um, yes. That is taking up also in the in this practical uh, training. Yes, this is uh, of quite. Uh, this is quite important. documentation is not seen as so important? It's an add-on, and if the, if the day is too busy, yep. it won't and take place. Yes. You put time up there. Yes, it's very important, yes. Yeah. Yes, but uh, it's, it's uh, about relevancy, too. You don't prior <laughs> prioritize this, and uh, if you don't do this, um, it, it won't happen. Um, from state to state, it's really different because I can say I am a Tierin. I went to school in Germany. And it really depends also on what state you're in and what you're interested in. For example, I did my Anerkennungsjahr, which is like practicum, in Waldorf. Mm -hmm. And they were, their um, direction was completely different than what I had learned at school. It was nothing like it because Waldorf has such specific and radical views. I really enjoyed it because I worked with the under twos and they weren't so strict. So you could kind of mix and match what you liked out of different directions if you went Waldorf or Steiner or uh, Waldorf or Steiner, sorry, but any of the other directions. And yeah, it always depended on what state, in my opinion, because the Orientierungsplan, which are like the um, plans which you did base your education on. They're very, very different. Uh, I had the opportunity to work in Baden-Württemberg, which is one state, and then in Hessen in another, and they were quite different. And it was quite interesting trying to apply the Hessen Bildungsplan because I didn't know anything about it because in our school we only had the one directed to our state. And so when I worked in a different state, it was quite difficult to get everything under, so to speak. And, and the, the consequence of this difference is, is that many teachers don't look at the plans, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> they, they just try to ignore them. And, and this is uh, why, actually, we are discussing a lot about how they can be implemented better. But uh, you uh, focused on um, a positive ex aspect of this uh, plurality or liberality that uh, you can build your own, um, you can realize your own ideas with the children. If, if you are interested in music, you do music with the children. If you, are, uh, you like art, you, you do some painting with the children. It helps also being able to adapt it to each individual child. If you have a child that's more artistic, you can watch it. Like what I had to do is I had to watch a child in multiple occasions and see what these occasions kind of showed me of this child. For example, my observation in the one case was the child was really, really interested in horses. 
And so I had to build an entire project around these child liking horses and I had to make it interesting and make a variety of it. Like it had to, inc well, I wanted to include music, um, practical things like sports or um, building a horse. And it was really odd because my schooling had not really gone into that very well. So just talk. Hello. <laughs> Okay, so I'm from Germany as well, actually from the same part as you, and I'm quite shocked to see what's <laughs> happening in the rest of the country, to be honest. <laughs> Maybe I mean, I've been talking bad, too bad about I Germany. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have the same experience as you, that we um, kind of learn about all the different um, philosophies of education, and then you can like, decide on your, like, which one you want to focus on. For me, it was nature education, so forest schools by kindergarten which is, um, yeah, but you actually, you can choose from all of them and they don't tell you this is right and this is wrong. This is probably one of the positives of the yes. um, curriculum, the open one that we have, yeah. But I just wanted to say it's not everywhere like this. <laughs> and no. um, I was quite shocked to see these learning stories, which are not learning stories, obviously. Mm. Yes, and we, like in my training, I learned how to use them. I actually did a project about New Zealand and learning stories as well. And it's just, you, you see all the options that you have and you can focus on one that you like. Hmm. I think one can say that it depends very much on the, the individual school, uh, really. school yeah. and on the individual teacher, what you do yeah. out of it. You can make a lot of it hmm. and there are excellent early childhood teachers in Germany. I don't want to um, make a f wrong impression, but um, there are others that it might be the same all over the world, I think. Mm -hmm. There are good, good ones in every job and bad ones too. But um, I think this uh, is a, a structural problem that, um, that the variety leads to um, laissez-faire. Mm -hmm. Or would you disagree? what I wanted to do. And um, we were taught, obviously, the different styles of this affair, autoritaire, authoritative. And we kind of got to choose our own way, but we were also told like to find a balance between them. And everyone was meant to find their own balance, because obviously, you can't tell someone how to do it. You just kind of have to work it out yourself. I'm wondering with the non-continuity between early childhood across all the states, whether there is continuity across the primary school and whether there's an overarching primary curriculum that the children are then measured against and then whether there's any push down from the primary schools to the early childhood centers saying you're not doing this or we expected this and you're not meeting it or whether there's that communication and um, I suppose an ideal transition between the two or whether they're very segmented and... Um... Uh, I feel that uh, there's a, um, a real a divide between uh, early childhood centers and schools. And the early childhood centers try to, um, well, we were talking about a fence, um, <laughs> Uh, but it depends in a positive way to, um, to preserve the children from um, being schoolified too much. And um, I think this is uh, something that many teachers in Germany in early childhood education want, that, that the children don't have to uh, learn mathematics or uh, language uh, writing uh, skills, li literacy skills. Um, so um, this is... Um, yeah, it's really a break between um, kindergarten and school. Does this mean that you're getting a lot more physical movement and development? And play. Yes, and yes. The, the traditional yes. play ideas. Yes, free play is, uh, plays a very big role, yes. Yes, it's very important, and the, the teachers uh, want to reserve as much time, many teachers want to reserve as much time as possible for this uh, free uh, play. So it sounds like pedagogically, 
the ideas are correct in as much as play for learning for kindergarten, but what's not there is the support for the teachers for assessing everything from that pedagogical viewpoint so that they and documenting it in a way that shows that yes they're doing this and this is why yes it's it's a kind of um um, um how do you say rechtfertigung justification yes um it's it's kind uh, documentation always seems to, uh, often seems to me like a justification for what they did all day and um and this is um it's, um, um, yes, it's a pity because um, they do so much um, important things in in the center, and they don't r realize it themselves. So, I think um, uh, having more time to reflect and to discuss with each, each other was, would help a lot. But this uh, time isn't given to them. So it's um, I don't think that it's an um, a bad attitude of of, uh, of the teachers to write these um, learning stories, but it's um, it's about a, a lack of uh, qualification of reflection, and it. Uh, yes. What about the traditional kindergarten model in which it's sessional? Is that getting overtaken by the the daycare phenomena? in which children are having to go for longer because parents are unable to arrange their work schedules? I think this is totally mixed up. I think what is um, known as a kindergarten model in other countries um, is not uh, conscious to us. It's um, um, Even though that's where we get the word. Yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and that's why we are so, so surprised that you do. <laughs> And uh, yes, this kindergarten idea um, um, of, of free play and uh, these things is still um, vital in Germany. But um, um, I think the connection to the idea of education is, is so hard to understand and to realize in everyday uh, work. Well, now I have the impression that I have been talking bad about my country. <laughs> I've, uh, it's, um, it's just a critic, critic analysis um, of, uh, of what, um, switch this off, um, about what uh, the, um, the teachers are doing. And um, I think um, if you look critically at documentation in other countries, you find bad examples anywhere. But um, my point is that uh, the kind of problems they have, uh, where do they struggle? This is interesting to me. And uh, what, uh, what do they need to, uh, to uh, raise the quality of documentation? One more? I was going to ask about the, OK, close. Um, and I hope I speak for most of the teachers here. When we go and do our job, we enjoy. We are there because we were meant to be there. And I'm hoping to go over there to the center and find out that the parents respect what I do and they value what I do. But um, the teachers, um, especially early child teachers in Germany, how are they viewed by the society per se, by the parents, the grandparents, what are they? Are they educators? Are they carers um, in the views of others? Is it a big thing to be a, an educator or is it just something that you just... And this is an important, important question. I think um, the most um, of my students and of uh, the educators going uh, to early childhood center are very identified is it, is it the right word? Identified with their job. They, they love to do it. And they want to work with children and uh, foster their development and everything. So to them, it's, it's really a great thing. And I think the view of society, of parents, grandparents, and so on, uh, is very diverse. There are some who are very grateful uh, to have a relief in their uh, work-life balance. Uh, others who are um, 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 
thankful the, for the um, uh, education they give there, but these are not too much. And, um, uh, and uh, for, for some parents, it's just bringing my kid and getting it in the evening or in the afternoon. So it's, it's very, um, there's a great variety. And um, regarding the, the wages, the loans, yeah, perhaps it's, maybe not a um, question. Not, uh, yes. <laughs> well, they uh, earn much less than uh, school teachers, so it's a totally different system, um, and there's a very um, huge difference between school teachers and early childhood teachers. So this expresses some of the uh, valuation in society of them. Um, raise yourself there's like a chart and depending on how many years you've worked you get more and more money and it is not much if you think about it and the pay if you compare the hours we put in the love we put into the children and the effort we put in and the fact that we went to uni for or to school for four years and spent so much time there and in three years we earn absolutely nothing it's free education but in three years you get absolutely nothing and in the practicum in year four you get not much, and you work 40 hours a week, basically, for nothing, and you still have to do so much. You have to plan projects. So much is expected from you, and the payout is so minimal. And this is quite frustrating for, yes. for many teachers, and um, so this has to be a thought of when you look at this, the quality of what comes out, because it's about motivation and valuation.